Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Trust that uh, you're all doing fine. We'll continue with our study. We've come till Acts chapter 12, and now we will begin to see the focus shift more to Apostle Paul. Okay, so we that's that's where we are headed. Uh, let's pray and get into chapter 13. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for uh, this wonderful time in your presence. Help us, Lord, to hear from you as we are studying from the book of Acts and deposit in us, O oh God, the revelation, uh, Father God, of uh, uh, all that uh, you you want to communicate to us, Father God. Once again, Lord, we uh, bless and thank you. And we pray, Lord, that uh, you will um, strengthen each of us, Lord, all of us connected to this class. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So Acts chapter 12. Would someone like to summarize key highlights? What happened? Yeah, look at your look at your Bible and tell me. Just highlights. Uh, maybe I studied about uh, uh, heroes, uh, the persecution that right. happened, and after yes. that, uh, Peter and James got arrested. They killed yes. James. That's right. And uh, uh, one thing uh, that because of church prayer, yes, God sent His angel to angels to deliver Peter right from right. prison. Okay, so that was amazing. Okay, praise God. Yeah. And what else? Anything else is happening? Pride. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So these are all things we saw. Then, uh, yes, they were back in Jerusalem. From where were they back? From Jerusalem to Antioch. Huh? From Jerusalem to Antioch. Why did they go to Jerusalem? They gave the relief. Okay, great. So you're all on track. That's uh, helpful to know. Now coming back to Acts chapter 13. Okay, so the time right now, it's already been, you could say, um, like uh, almost uh, 10, 10 years. Okay, uh, and we are at AD 46. By the time we are here, at Acts chapter 13. So like roughly 10 years have passed since the uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit. So you can imagine 10 years, the church has grown, leaders have grown. James is already murdered. James, the brother of John is murdered. Um, and uh, the church has spread to many different parts of the Judean region. So we, we have understood that much. There is one... Um, prominent church in Syria, which is the church of Antioch, which has leaders. Who is the primary leader? Antioch? Barnabas. He went and brought uh, Saul, Paul, he brought him here. And uh, uh, now together they are doing the ministry. What did they do one year? Teaching, equipping. Also the church is growing pretty well. That's what we can understand. We will see in verse 1 itself, in Antioch, the ministry grows to such an extent that there are a set of leaders. Set of leaders. So can someone read Acts 13 verse 1? Acts 13 verse 1. Yes. Now in the church, I was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Yes. Barnabas. Simeon, who was called Nicor, Gideon of Cyrene, Manel, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and so Okay, so. Um, we are observing what is called as team ministry. Till now. There was still a team only, even in Jerusalem, apostles are there, leaders are there. Uh, but it's like a pattern. See, as we study uh, the book of Acts, you would also notice the emergence of governance, administration over the church. So in the beginning, it was all the apostles. 
but as they went on act 6 we saw there were volunteers okay uh, and then the apostles are taking strong leadership of the church similarly in the church of antioch it's not like only barnabas is running the show or he brought saul so saul and barnabas they are running the show it's not like that you have more people there is a simeon there is a lucius there is a manen and saul so there there is a team ministry team ministry in the team who are the teachers whom do we know barnabas and saul are teachers now we don't know much about these other people simeon lucius manen whether they are prophets or you know any other kind of uh, role they have but remember paul wrote about this in ephesians 4 fivefold ministry office so for the first time we are seeing that is happening fivefold ministry office within the antioch context so it's not just the teacher it's not just the pastor maybe you can call barnabas as pastor pastor teacher maybe one of them was a prophet we don't know right maybe one of them was an evangelist we don't know okay so uh, the fivefold ministry as spoken of by paul in ephesians and corinthians is emerging in antioch that's how they did ministry it was never a one man show okay so there was a team serving the church together and observe observe who they are barnabas was he a rich man yeah remember he sold his land and he was offering it to the church so yeah he was very rich among these people uh we don't know like about the status of the others uh but then what about their you know their uh, ethnicity or the places from where they came it clearly says simeon from niger then lucius from cyrene from different places okay and it also says manen who was brought up with herod the tetrarch herod the tetrarch is likely to be uh, the person who beheaded john the baptist so he is from a royal family this manen what is it the picture it gives us is their social standing was different so all these people are it's not like they're all from the same community or same social strata of society there is a sense of unity some may be very rich some may not be so rich some are from one particular place some is on but there is a sense of unity that is something we have to appreciate so when there is a team ministry can god use people from many different walks of life answer is yes think about this paul who is paul educated well trained under gamaliel who is peter fisherman what is you know in terms of uh, uh, education he is not like paul but they are working together peter paul serving the lord so that's how it is in the kingdom of god we all have different backgrounds but thank god you know god still uses all of us we can all work together we are all from different parts and uh, uh, god can work through all of us all of us so that's the conclusion then uh, what else can we observe we can observe yeah there are spiritual leaders more spiritual leaders uh, in the church so again we generally say that spiritual the number of spiritual leaders we have in a church determines the strength of the church if you have only one spiritual leader it's nice very nice it's good you have a strong spiritual leader but what about the future what about continuity you know what about uh, proper support for the people it may not be possible because how much one person can do but if you have more spiritual leaders it's like you know we are sitting in this room 
usually when there are big structures there are many pillars people will put pillars even in between the hall you'll see some pillars why support strength so the more the pillars the stronger the building in the same way when it comes to the church church of antioch strong church it's not only on barnabas it's not only on saul paul it's there are more leaders strong leaders are there so today that's the challenge you and i have as we are raising up the church we have to train up people it may not be easy to train up people but as we work with them as we guide them as we lead them uh, there'll be strong leaders and if there are strong leaders church will be strong that's how we must think never think okay i'm going to do everything alone no 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 we are here today who knows god may call us to other things in some time so somebody should be ready to take charge of wherever we have been so far right so more the leaders it's like more pillars in the church and churches strong let's go to verse 2 okay verse 1 we discussed 10 minutes so verse 2 let's see how long we're going to take um, can somebody read it please while they were worshiping the lord and fasting the holy spirit said set apart for me barnabas and saul for the work to which i have called them mm, okay so many things to understand from what this verse is saying as they ministered to the lord and fasted so this again shows they had that practice of meeting together praying together fasting together so shows that the system was a good system in antioch okay so they were spending time the leadership was spending time with god now think about this as you know they ministered to the lord it says many of us what happens is we minister to people but in the kingdom of god in our relationship with god there are two directions in which we must look one is minister to people but there is also ministry to god what is the ministry to god yeah praising god worshiping god spending time with god reading his word prayer right many of those things so unless we are ministering to god our ministry to people will not be effective now it is possible in the ministry to become so busy that we are only ministering to people we say we are in ministry ministering to people ministering to people preaching house visit prayer meeting fasting prayer worship it goes on and on okay but when is the time that we are going to spend with god sometimes <coughs> even as ministers of god we struggle but that is very dangerous if we keep running like that without ministering to god look at the leaders of the church of antioch they are ministering to the lord we have to learn from them even in act 6 also they said we can't wait tab- we can't uh, you know wait uh, uh, watch tables uh, that work has to be given to others so that we can spend time in the word and prayer that's what the leaders said so a requirement for the leadership is a strong walk with the lord we have to maintain that there is no compromise if we maintain that it's literally like foundation will become hollow we can't afford to do that so the leadership is strong in the book of acts the church of antioch they ministered to the lord and fasted so when when is our um, special time with the lord every day every week suppose ministry becomes so rush it's okay to take time out you say sorry i can't come i'm cancelling these appointments i have to spend time with god if i don't spend time with god what ministry am i going to do right so we have to make sure that even in our lives never come to a place where you know when we are riding the bike it says reserve <laughs> here if you keep riding on reserve what will happen just stop it will not work anymore so that's dangerous so they do not do that instead they spend time with the lord fasted 
And when we are ministering to God, here's the second thing. Holy Spirit said. Okay, that means when we when we speak to God, He speaks to us. So when we are praying, fasting, we can expect God to speak to us. The Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So God is giving them, a, uh, you can say, like a different directive. Something different. They thought that they they just have to, uh, you know, be there in the church and uh, do the teaching and all of those things. But God is saying something different. He's saying from now onwards, Barnabas and Saul, I have some work for them to do. Let them, release them. Because I am telling them to do something else. So do you think it would have been easy for the leaders to allow Barnabas and Saul to go? Yes or no? No. Uh, yeah, it would not have been easy, but Holy Spirit is saying, no. Have to obey. There's no other way. Holy Spirit is saying, so we have to obey. It would have been challenging, but they obeyed. And they have to let go. So now, if we want uh, God to speak to us about our ministry, about our church, then how can we do that? Just spend time with the Lord, fasting, prayer. Whenever we do those things, direction is coming, right? It's coming. Holy Spirit said to them, you do this. So this is a lesson also we can learn and uh, we can apply. Uh, then he is also, how did this come to them? Maybe like a prophetic word, we don't know. One of them may have sensed in their spirit and all the others may have agreed that, yeah, correct, what you're saying is correct. So that word came uh, and God was quite specific. Only two people out of all of you, Barnabas and Saul. So the others would have stayed back to take care of the church. These two people, they were called to something else. Then it says, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Ultimately, they obeyed. They obeyed. Now starts what is called as the first missionary journey of Paul. Who was with him in this first missionary journey? Barnabas. Okay. Uh, so let me quickly show the map. Those of us who are in class, are you connected to... You are okay, fine. Then I'll you'll be able to see it. Yes, I hope you can see it. Yeah, okay. Right, so this is how the first missionary journey looks. Yeah, so it's probably bigger now. If you can see the arrows, they have started from Antioch. There is a star there, Antioch. And from Antioch, they are moving all these black dots are the stops that they are making. So they come to this island of Cyprus. They stop by at a place called Salamis, Paphos, and continue with the arrow. The arrow is going to Perga, right? And from there, yeah, it, it's one second. No, you have to follow the, Antioch. yeah, <laughs> Perga to Antioch. Antioch to? No, 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 no. There are two arrows there. One is moving towards and then one return journey. Return journey also happens in the same way. So continue on with um, Antioch, Iconium. Iconium. Okay. Then follow the arrow. From there, Lystra. From Lystra to Derby. 
right now after that is a return now follow the arrow back back to lystra back to iconium back to antioch right perga atalia from here seleucia right and back to antioch got it so this is what the first missionary journey looks like and the duration of the first missionary journey is uh, from AD 46 to 48. So roughly about two years, Paul and Barnabas took time to go to these places to minister as the Lord led them. So first they come to a place called Cyprus. So what is so special about Cyprus? We have seen in the map, it's an island. Okay, so they must have traveled by sea to go there. And Cyprus is also um, the home country of Barnabas. So why did they go there to Cyprus? Because maybe Barnabas thought, I already know the country. So if I have to do ministry, it will be a little bit easy. Definitely Holy Spirit would have guided. But they knew that it was familiar also. So they go to Cyprus. Then they go to Salamis. Right, Salamis, we saw it is on the east coast uh, of the island. And uh, there, what did they do? Verse 5, they were preaching in the Jewish synagogues. So why are they preaching in the Jewish synagogues? Yeah, but why not on the street? Why the synagogue? That could be partly the answer, first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. So that's the mindset. Good. That's one answer. What else could be another reason? Why a synagogue? Why not just somewhere go and preach? Okay. Paul may be knowing all the people. Fine. Uh, invited, I don't know. But uh, usually what happens is that in a synagogue setting, anyone can stand up and speak. They're allowed to. Got it? So there is a chance or an opportunity. Like if Paul goes uh, to a synagogue and he stands up and starts, like even Jesus went and he was teaching in the synagogue. So people can actually put forth their views. Okay? <coughs> so because the opportunity is there in the synagogue, people will be there to listen they would have gone there. So that also shows us today when we do ministry, we can go to any place. It's fine. But if we are strategic, we will go where the people are. You got it. So that's how they are working. They go to the synagogue because people are there. Opportunity is there. Let's share. So somewhat like that. Now, they are preaching in Salamis, in the synagogues, to the Jews. And verse 5 also says, they also had John as their assistant. Who is this John? John Mark. Yeah, who is John Mark? Mary. Mary. Right, right. Where the prayer meeting was held for Peter's release. So that is the John we are talking about, John Mark. This John Mark is an important personality. We are going to talk about him later also um, at the start of... Um, Okay, anyway, so we will talk more about John Mark shortly. Uh, but for now, just know that... So how many people are there in the trip? Three. Three people are there. Okay, let's move on. Now verse 6. From there, they come to an island called as Paphos. Now in Paphos, something happens and uh, we'll, we'll look into that. So when they come to Paphos, there is a... A proconsul. Proconsul is somebody who is in a government office, influential man of man. And apparently he is interested in knowing about God. So we can call him the governor. Okay, governor. And he was an intelligent man. His name is Sergius Paulus. But Sergius Paulus also had a sorcerer. Who, who was, uh, you know, 
with him. We don't know why there was a sorcerer with a governor, but maybe their times in, in their times they needed spiritual guidance for the leaders or something like that. So there is a sorcerer, and this sorcerer was a huge hindrance in um, uh, Sergius Paulus understanding about God. So this governor is interested to know about God. But who is stopping him? Sorcerer. sorcerer. The name of the sorcerer? Elimus or Bar Jesus. Okay. So when this happens, um, Paul, he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he, he rebukes the sorcerer. Now look at what he says in verse 10. He says, O oh, full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? What, what does this look like? He's rebuking. Okay, he's rebuking a sorcerer. But how does Paul know that he's full of deceit and fraud? Word of knowledge, Holy Spirit, word of knowledge. Remember Peter also, Ananias and Sapphira, why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? So what is what is the lesson for us? The early church people were, they were operating in the gifts of the Spirit at all times. Okay. And uh, Paul, rightly as you put, through the word of knowledge, he understood what this Elimus is all about. So he's discerning in the spirit and he recognizes it's a demonic. What's going on here is demonic. So he rebukes him. And what happens after he rebukes him in verse 9? It says, uh, he says, you will go blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And it happened. So this person, he became blind. And uh, there was even somebody who had to lead him because he went blind. But what was the result of overcoming this demonic work by, uh, by Elimus? Verse 12, the proconsul believed when he saw what he had, what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So there was a believer in Paphos, Influential man, Sergius Paulus, intelligent man. So can intelligent people, very learned people, influential people accept Christ? Of course, Jesus came for all of us. So they can. But what is the next lesson that we learn? You no, know, sometimes there are spiritual forces that are stopping people from accepting Christ. Till we bind them, till we get them out of the way, the gospel will not be, you know, like uh, they will not be able to perceive it. That's what happened, right, in this case. So Paul had to first do spiritual warfare, get rid of the demonic. He repukes, he says, stop, out of the way. Once this is out of the way, the blindness which was there for this intelligent man, the blindness was gone. And he was able to accept Christ. So when we are doing evangelism, when we are doing outreach, when we are doing, um, when we are reaching out to people, spiritual warfare, prayer, operating by the gifts of the spirit, right? Binding the works of the enemy is going to make it easier for people to come to Christ. That's the lesson that we are learning in Paphos. That's what happened. So once this Elimus was dealt with, Sergius Paulus believed and he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. That means that Paul and Barnabas must have taught him from God's word. He's a new believer. So they must have taught him and he was amazed by what was taught to him. Now, where did they go from Paphos? You remember the map? We said they went to Cyprus. Perga, very good, right. Perga, and from there, where did they go? Antioch. Antioch, okay. So remember, we said there are many Antiochs. Please don't get confused. So this is another Antioch. Which Antioch uh, is there in Acts 11? From where Paul and Barnabas are? 
Correct. Very good. Antioch of Syria. Now we are talking about Antioch of Pisidia. Okay. Now let's see what happens. They go um, to Perga. Okay. This verse 13 is very crucial. Something happens. What happens? Can someone read it? Acts 13, verse 13. Now, when Paul and his party set sail from Papus, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Uh, so there are two major changes. Anyone notice it, noticed one major change? John departed. Okay, that is one change. What is the other change? Mm -hmm. Departing, uh, not really. Okay, fine. Let's look at this. <coughs> See, um, firstly, I want to tell us that uh, why is this name Saul and Paul? Like till uh, when, when he was an unbeliever and uh, after he started preaching also, we were calling him Saul. Okay. Uh, but then now we are calling him Paul. So from Acts 11, he is being called Paul. Reason is um, there are two names. One is a Hebrew name and one is a Latin name. So Saul is Hebrew name. Latin name is Paul. So why did they start calling him Paul? We don't know. But both were his names, Saul and Paul. All right. So they, he's being called as Paul. That is one thing. Second thing, crucial. Did you notice when God told in uh, verse 2, set aside for me Barnabas and Paul for the work of the ministry. Now what is happening in Luke's writing? Now Paul and his party set sail from Pakistan. He's there. But what happened? Yeah, like All is in English. Writing. Somehow, uh, God, is, God is putting the spotlight on Paul. Till now, it was Barnabas. Now it is Paul and his party. And we are saying missionary journeys of Paul. Not that Barnabas is not there. He's very much there. Uh, but the Holy Spirit wants to convey something from the missionary journey of Paul. So we are going to focus on Paul starting now. Okay. And that second aspect, John departed. Why did John depart? Any ideas? He was scared. He was scared possible. So you see both Barnabas and Paul were uh, you could say seasoned ministers of God and they had a singular focus that we have to go to different places, we have to preach the gospel but John Mark was mostly like a younger person so when he saw these two leaders doing so much, he must have been exhausted looking at them like, oh my goodness, I can't do this. This is too much. You know, I, they, they are asking for too much discipline. They're asking for too much this. Too, I can't do this. So maybe John Mark departed because he was intimidated by the company of uh, Paul and uh, Barnabas. Some people also say that Maybe he left uh, because his mother was not well. But we don't have proof to show, you know, uh, why he actually left. We don't know. But it is likely that he couldn't handle the stress of ministry. And so he left. Okay. But let me share now itself. You know, this John Mark, later on again, Barnabas will try to take him on a missionary journey. That time Paul is very angry. He says, why you want to bring that guy? You know, he couldn't even, he couldn't even manage till uh, Perga. And he went back. 
so we don't want such a person who has come but who left uh, but later on paul will write and say bring mark he's useful for me so it is likely that john mark proved himself later on and you know who he is he's the writer of the book of mark okay so he also became one of the people in ministry thank god uh, maybe when he was young he was not sort of you know fit enough to handle the stress of ministry but he became fit and then he became one of the uh, accepted and wanted leaders by paul so that is the significance of verse 13 <clears throat> let's move on from verse 14 now they come to antioch and as their practice was went to the synagogue and they started to share there so they begin to preach the word of god and uh, people are listening in that place okay so the you see like a long sermon once again made by uh, paul and part of the preaching he brings his emphasis to uh, david because he's preaching to the jews so again one more thing that we will observe is when they are preaching to a certain audience they will keep their context in mind so if it is in the synagogue they have to talk about you know moses and david and all of those people so he's focusing on david and through david he's pointing to jesus as the messiah he talks about the death resurrection and shows how uh, christ jesus is the fulfillment of all the things that were spoken uh, regarding david so in psalms you know god makes many promises to david like your descendant will be on the throne and all so he tries to explain to the jews that you know what actually all this is pointing towards jesus so that's why um, you know he he goes to the synagogue okay and uh, regarding david there is a statement in verse 22 can someone read it and when he had removed him he raised up for them david as a king uh -huh. to whom also he gave testimony and said i have found david the son of jesse a man after my own heart who will do all my will mm, okay so a man after my own heart who will do all my will about david it says so why is david a man after god's own heart yes correct so that's a that's a, a truth that we must understand if we want to be people after god's own will then as long as we do what god is doing god is asking us to do we can be like david but if we are disobedient we cannot be like david people after god's own will god's own heart okay so the why was david called as a man after god's own heart simply because he did the will of god and we too today can be obedient then we become uh, such people whom god loves so after all this after this whole preaching what happened no there were devout jews uh, who wanted to hear more from paul uh, paul and barnabas about this jesus so the entire city right it showed up on the sabbath to hear the word of god so when it looked like paul and barnabas are gaining popularity in the city of antioch see in the synagogue jews are listening but the gentiles also are interested so how can <coughs> gentiles um uh, follow god or follow yahweh god in in this context in this culture uh okay i don't know if uh, they were circumcised <coughs> but there is something known as proselytes okay proselytes are gentiles who have chosen to follow judaism so we call them devout gentiles or proselytes so these proselytes are the ones who say we loved your message paul and barnabas please come preach again and on the sabbath they arrange for another meeting 
and when the whole town in fact the scripture says the entire city they all came to listen to this new message by paul and barnabas when the jews saw what was going on they became jealous and now they started to oppose the things that were being preached by paul we see this towards the end over there right verses uh, uh maybe 44 45 around there we see that the jews are turning against paul and barnabas so uh, what decision do paul and barnabas make at that point you know they say look if uh, you were, if the jews are not going to listen to us we will just go to the gentiles we will go to those who want to listen right so then they shift their work and they say we are going to minister to the gentiles and uh, while they make this decision there's a fulfillment of scripture in the earlier prophetic words of isaiah he talks about how the gospel will go to the gentiles the go- the gentiles are going to respond so it's actually happening okay in those times when paul and barnabas are ministering in antioch it's nothing new it's all there in the uh, words spoken remember even when jesus is doing the miracles and all you have in the gospels it says as it was written and then you have a quotation from the old testament so somewhat like that now the gospel is going to the gentiles as it was written Isaiah if you want references Isaiah 42 verse 6 Isaiah 49 verse 6 these are all passages where God had already told that the gentiles are going to hear the gospel so it's happening okay now what else can we learn from this see Paul and Barnabas wanted to speak to the Jews but they ended up speaking to the gentiles and we also notice it's a fulfillment of god's purpose right so there are times when through circumstances god will lead us what is the circumstance now can't talk to the jews they are opposing option is only gentiles so uh, through circumstances also god can guide us lead us and help us fulfill his purpose however one disclaimer always don't depend on circumstances because the main way in which god leads us is through his word and of course his holy spirit circumstances if you are going to grade the ways in which god leads us it is down there in the list so every time we cannot depend on circumstances but yes there are times when depending on the circumstances we can tell this is what god is doing or this is what god is leading me into okay so yeah any any thoughts as of now because we have observed what has happened in antioch right i didn't read through the whole passage uh but hopefully you know the summary is helping us this is what happened okay let's go ahead and uh, complete then so in verse 48 if you want to track with me verse 48 now the gentiles have heard the gospel and they were glad they were glad they glorified the word of the lord uh, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed so there is a good response from the gentiles then what happens after that was 49 the word of the lord was being spread throughout all the region but the jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city raised up persecution against paul and barnabas and expelled them from their region <coughs> but they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to iconium and the disciples were filled with joy and with the holy spirit so again based on circumstances jews are so angry that they throw them out expel okay it would have been quite painful they went to do god's work but now 
thrown out of the city. But God is leading them into another place, Iconium. So they are moving wherever there are open doors. Now door is closed in Antioch of Pisidia. They want to do, but uh, they can't. So what to do now? Next. Come on, let's go. So from here, if you remember the map, they go to the next place called as Iconium. Okay, Iconium, Lystra, Derby. They'll do God's work there. And they'll also come back. That's the first missionary journey. Same route. Why do they come back same route? Right, right. So it, it's very much like a, like a pastoral, apostolic way of working where, yeah, we preached, but how are those believers doing? Are they growing in the Lord? What should we teach them? That kind of a heart, appointing leaders, let the church thrive. So there's an oversight on the groups of believers in all of these regions. Okay. So, yeah, I'll stop right here. If there's anything you all want to discuss about, we can. If not, uh, we'll just pray and close. When we see here, like when uh, Paul or not just Paul and Barnabas, but also when we saw Peter, huh. when they went and when they spoke for Gentiles, like all of them responded to the word and many of them got convicted and accepted Jesus. But why we are not can't able to see that kind of result now? Because mm. even there are many people who are going out to yeah. the Gentiles, reaching out to Gentiles, doing a work, but there is no response. Like mm -hmm. how we see like maybe not an immediate response, maybe not in that impact. Mm -hmm. So what can be the reason and what? Maybe we should adapt to see that kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, what comes to my mind right now is two things. One is the kind of effort they made. See, they went out. How many of us believers we step out? Tell me. Hardly, hardly. It's only maybe Christmas we have some little bit of josh. Okay, I will make something and give my neighbor and share. But more than that, are we willing to be salt and light right, to people or in our workplace? How many of us are uh, able to share our testimony or you know share the gospel? So stepping out is one thing. They stepped out. So that also will give us the opportunity to speak to people. So stepping out is one. Second is, as we saw um, in the case of El uh, Elimus, right? He rebuked or he took charge over the, that demonic uh, force. So I think that's the second thing, spiritual warfare. Sometimes we lack in the area of spiritual warfare. We step out. We do a lot of outreaches and we minister to people, but we don't pray enough. We don't deal with the devil. Like you're supposed to bind that strong man. Then there's a better environment. If we study about revivals, which you have, so much prayer was there, no? They all prayed so much. Then the revival came and multitudes of people came rushing. Uh, but behind that, prayer, spiritual warfare. I think th these two things, uh, Prince, stepping out and spiritual warfare. Sure. So we'll um, wrap up right now. And I just want to request anyone from class to pray. Father, we thank you for this wonderful time, Lord, as we have studied about the word of God, Lord Jesus. That uh, we saw that boldness of Saul. And as they preached in that areas, Father, Father, we ask that boldness in our lives, Father. And we ask Holy Spirit to lead us in a mighty way that we can do also, that as you say, uh, use them. Thank you so much, Father, for leading this and teaching. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. We'll meet you all next week. <laughs>